we'll get started in a few moments. Thanks. Thank you everyone for joining us. It takes Zoom about a minute to add everybody into the call. So just please sit tight and we'll get started in a few moments. Thank you very much. Okay, hopefully Zoom has had time to add everybody. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on society. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications, and I'll be moderating this event. The public health guidance is clear. Wear a mask to help limit the spread of the virus. But there are many kinds of face coverings out there and lots of questions about their effectiveness. We have two Duke scholars with us today to discuss a new method of testing mask effectiveness they introduced in a paper newly published in the journal Science Advances. I'll introduce our speakers and get the discussion started, then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, we are recording this briefing and that recording will be sent to everyone who registered. Thanks to those reporters who already sent questions. We have lots of them. We'll get through as many as we can. During this discussion, those of you joining us on Zoom can also submit questions via the Q&A window at any time. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions in person in a few minutes. Thanks also to everyone watching this on YouTube. So with us today is Martin Fisher. He is a chemist and physicist here at Duke. He is also director of the Advanced Light Imaging and Spectroscopy Facility, where he focuses on exploring new optical contrast mechanisms for molecular imaging. Good morning. Good morning, Greg. Also joining us is Dr. Eric Westman. He is an associate professor of medicine at Duke, where he was an early champion of masking as a means to curtail the spread of coronavirus and has been working with a local nonprofit to provide free masks to at-risk and underserved populations in the greater community here in Durham, North Carolina. Good morning, Dr. Westman. Good morning, Greg. And I'd like to start with you. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of people are asking whether masks really make a difference in limiting the spread of the virus. What did your research reveal about that fact? Well, there were two major findings, I, I think, from what we did. One was that people do expel particles when they speak. You don't have to cough or, or sneeze to potentially spread the COVID-19 disease. And that was replicable and, and over and over. And you can actually see the visualization of it with the laser apparatus that Dr. Fisher came up with. The second finding is that some masks work really well, others don't work as well. And I think that what's left to discuss is what's the balance of how good a mask you need and where are you going, are you going to use it in a hospital or in the community setting? You know, our, our study was designed uh, to be a quick answer at a time back in April when we didn't have a whole lot of resources available. And so I called Dr. Fisher here at Duke to help set up the apparatus to test all the different masks, including ones being made by volunteers, you know, to see if they really work. So uh, I think uh, Martin, you can explain how you tested them. Yeah, so Dr. Fisher, let's, uh, Professor Fisher, let's move on to you. Um, can you talk about the testing technique that you came up with and what you found in terms of how some face coverings are more effective than others? Sure. So this was, of course, a, a demonstration of the technique, as Dr. Westman already pointed out. This was not meant as a systematic study of all mass types, of all mass materials, all wear conditions. We tested the, the uh, masks that we had at hand. So the way we actually performed the test was conceptually very simple. Imagine you have a laser beam, you expand that in the vertical direction to make this into a light sheet, into a really thin sheet of light. You, you thread that through a box from the left on the right, there's a slit in this box. You have a camera in the back and on the front, you have a hole to speak into with or without mask. What happens when a droplet goes through that light sheet it actually scatters light into the camera and also into your eyes, and you see these flashes of light. So by counting these flashes, we can get an idea of how many droplets you emit as a function of time and when you speak. Gotcha, thank you. And of course, uh, as a, as through the conducting of this demonstration, you tested different kinds of masks. And obviously one of the findings that people have been particularly curious about is what you found regarding uh, different kinds of masks. So can you talk a little bit about the different uh, spreads of droplets that you saw uh, with the different kinds of masks that you tested? Sure. So first of all, overall, 
the majority of those masks we tested worked just fine. Of course, there was a, there was a spread in masks, right? That we tested everything from a fitted N95 mask to very thin masks. So let's start with the N95. It was a, a fitted um, N95 without valve and that mask did about as good as, it could, as you could think. So we did not see any droplets at all, any appreciable droplet coming out of this mask at all. Of course, keep in mind that we wanna make sure that these masks are reserved for healthcare workers because these are in short, short supply. And then the, the cotton mask, for example, the, we tested a range of cotton masks, just a couple that we had, and they blocked about 80% of the droplets, which of course is perfectly fine for everyday use. Um, you didn't have to have a, a perfect mask if you go out in the public. And we also saw some surprises, some masks that didn't quite perform as well as we thought they could do. So of course, keep in mind, specifically this, the, the neck gaiter that everybody keeps talking about. We tested one neck gaiter, which was a single layer neck gaiter. It was a polyester spandex mix, which was pretty thin. So if you, if you pull that and you hold it up to the light, you actually see light through it. It's very easy to breathe through, which of course, then necessarily means more breathability, less protection, right? So for that specific mask, we actually saw what seemed to be an increase in the particle numbers. We attribute that to the, the mesh, the fabric, actually dispersing some of those droplets. So turning the bigger droplets into a bunch of little droplets, which of course then increase the number of total droplets. What makes that Somewhat concerning is that the big droplets, you might emit a big droplet and it might fall to the ground. The little droplets, however, <clears throat> they have an easier time hovering in the air or maybe, maybe being carried away by air currents. Sure, and uh, as you've seen in some of the reporting on this study already, there's been a lot of a focus on uh, your finding with the gator. Um, and people drawing the conclusions that, uh, as you found, you know, the gator in, in your testing, the gator actually seemed to cause more spread. Um, so one of the questions we've had from reporters is that should the public use this study as evidence that wearing neck, neck gaiters in general is worse than nothing to slow the spread of COVID-19? Absolutely not. So we tested one mask because we just, we just had that mask lying around. As I mentioned, it was a pretty thin mask. There are plenty of other gaiters out there. There are some that have thicker material. Um, if, you, if you double them up, if you, if you fold them over, you have more layers, or maybe you wore two of those skaters. I am, we haven't tested that, but I'm convinced the results will be different, likely better. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, things that general curiosity we're having from reports of both of you is, as you said, you have demonstrated now this testing technique for masks. Uh, is this something where you plan to uh, try to further develop and enhance the technique or is this a technique you're hoping that people can now take into the onto the medical side and, and start doing more comprehensive testing of masks where do you think this should go from here well both so let me tell you what we're not going to do we certainly don't have the bandwidth and the resources to do lots of mass testing we get lots of requests i'm inundated with emails um, saying can you test this can you test that i just don't have the, the resources to do that but you already mentioned, Greg, what we developed a simple technique and we hope that other people will go out there and actually replicate this. And we didn't do a systematic studies study, but other people can. That's why we published this. It's a very easy setup. Um, we'd be happy to help, but it's, everything's in the paper. It's, it's almost trivial to, to replicate. Now with one caveat, of course, is we, we don't recommend everyone to do this at home on the kitchen table because the, the lasers that are involved in this, the lasers that you, that you use for this, they're, they're pretty powerful. So you do need to be aware of laser safety just because these lasers can do permanent eye damage. So that's why we focus on, on, the, on, on labs, on, on companies, on maybe colleges, high school projects where you have supervision, you have somebody who knows what the dangers are, but it's setting this up is very, it's very cheap. You can probably be built this up for, for $200. Thank you. Uh, one question I'm curious to get the, a take from both of you on is we had this question as regards, you know, you, you, uh, you studied the, uh, the outlet, uh, the outpouring of droplets. Do you have any, would, would this technique work to study intake of air as opposed to, um, you know, exhaling of air? 
And Dr. Westman, maybe you could speak to whether that would be significant because, you know, we talk about masks obviously protecting other people uh, in terms of uh, exhaling, but people also hope that it's going to provide some protection for themselves. Did you guys look at that in this test or could this technique uh, also be used to measure um, inhaling of droplets? So that's an important point that there are two, uh, two important issues. One is, does the mask protect the person who wears the mask, the wearer, and then does the mask protect other people from the, the wearer who might be sick and not know it. So one of the twists in this investigation was, if you have an N95 mask with a valve that allows you to exhale, the particles go out freely. You don't, there's no filter on the exhalation. So the N95 with a valve on it did not work well to protect other people possibly, but it would protect the person who wears it. So you have to consider, are you talking about a hospital grade? You're going into a room where you know there's a virus, there's someone whose infection is in the room. You need the N95, uh, protect the wearer. That's the main point. In community use, it's just as important. Are you spreading it possibly to other people? So there, there's that balance in the consideration of how you test something. Are you inhaling it? The old way of just testing things or are you exhaling to see if it spreads to others now the optical measurement that the kind of situation we did um we used an exhalation into a box i'm uh, uh, dr fisher i'm sure you could turn that into an optical measurement of inhalation i i can't envision that at the moment but you're absolutely right. Right now, the setup is certainly not capable of doing the, the inverse. So we, we can't measure the inhalation at all right now. Gotcha. Understood. Uh, we have a question that's come through in the Q&A. And I, I would remind um, journalists that are on the call that you can submit a question in the Q&A or you can uh, raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, I've certainly had lots of questions submitted in advance, too. I'm going to try and get through those. But the question in the Q&A is that what is your advice, if anything, to people in hot, humid climates, in, let's, for example, in the South, who have switched to net gaiters and maybe moved away from fabric masks when they're when they're outside. Is there anything that uh, your research has found that, that would prompt you to give them any advice? Yeah, you know, I'd like to expand the, our discussion on the net gaiters, and that is, I think it should at least tell people to take a pause and consider what you're doing. If it is a one layer spandex, uh, polyester, stretchy fabric that you can breathe easily through and blow out a candle through it, this is not going to be protecting very well, we, we think. Uh, so, but if it is a double layer, uh, it's more comfortable, um, it's probably gonna do better, but I have to say we haven't tested that. So I think the, the burden of proof or the onus is on people who say you can use this and it will protect you to show that it really does protect. You realize we have very little evidence that even cotton masks when people wear them or other bandanas things like that very little testing on that at all which is really why this investigation i think has gotten so much interest is because it's just starting the research on this with people wearing these different sorts of things so you know if you're wearing a, a gator out there you know, if you're not around anyone else it's no big deal so i've had questions of what if i'm running out in uh, in central park well, if no one else is around, you may not even need a mask at all. Uh, you know, so, uh, but if you're using something that doesn't provide much barrier, it's probably not protecting you or other people very much. But, but again, we're, we're probably, we're speculating. I'd really like to see a lot more data uh, wrapped around this whole issue of the fabrics that haven't been well tested. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fisher, we've got had another a question in the chat. You mentioned that the, the gator you tested was one you had lying around and it was a polyester spandex mix. Do you have any information on what the percentage uh, of polyester to spandex was? Obviously, there are a lot of gators around there and people are curious uh, about the, the, the nature of the one that you in fact tested. Right. It was a 92% polyester, 8% spandex. Okay, fantastic. That answers a bunch of questions in one go, as a matter of fact. Um, Okay, so we have, um, I'm coming down to uh, another one of our questions here. So the issue of fit is obviously huge, especially when people talk about surgical masks. Um, and a question that we had come in said, many masks are ill-fitting or improperly worn by users. 
Uh, did you assign a grading scale for reduced efficacy based on, based on the quality of mask filtration, as well as whether it fit tightly around the nose and chin, and whether it's worn as designed? Um, so our current measurement setup will actually cannot distinguish between particles that make it through the mask and particle that escapes through the gaps. We are, we are working on a refinement of the technique that possibly will be able to distinguish those two particles. And I think I completely agree. That's a very, very important question. And you can wear the, a perfect material mask and if it dangles off your ear, it's not gonna do anything, right? So yes, it is, a, it is a very valid question, but we can't answer that right now. We hope to be able to do this in the future. Sure, thank you. Um, you also made the comment about um, when you held up the gate or the light passed through it. We've had a question that suggests that um, when people are at home making masks or just having to choose between masks they've got lying around, is that a good basic at home barometer? Uh, if light shines through a mask um, or if it doesn't shine through a mask, then you can be confident that the, the mask that light doesn't shine through is probably going to be more effective than the one it does. Or is it not quite that simple? Well, it's not that simple. Right. I mean, it depends on the flashlight you hold behind it. I mean, I, I can demonstrate this with a, with a pretty powerful flashlight. So you, you, you can see this actually going through. Right? I'm not sure with the background here, but it really depends on the kind of flashlight you have. It depends on, on your eyes. We, we really would like to see this as just sort of a, a sanity check, if you wish. If it's not a quantitative measure by any means, it's just sort of I think it should raise the awareness. If you have two masks and one of them is really easy to see through, easy to breathe through, and another one that's not, it's probably a good bet that the thicker one will, will perform better. But we don't want to view this as a, as a hard, fast rule. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and a follow-up question that we had related to that. If people are making masks at home, when you look at the masks you tested, are there particular materials just based on uh, the test that you did that you would recommend ahead of other materials? What kind of things should people bear in mind if they are making masks at home based on what you found? So from, from the materials we had, we can't actually tell. We have no information on the details of what kind of cotton that was. Um, we have information on the, on the number of layers. Um, but of course, again, generally, the more layer, the better. With the caveat is, well, if you add more layers, eventually you won't be able to breathe through those anymore. So it's a trade-off, right? If you have too many layers, it just gets too uncomfortable and you won't actually wear it. So we'd rather have a mask that may not perform that perfectly, but you actually put them on. Sure, absolutely. Dr. Westman, um, we have a question here. When people are worried about you know, transmission and droplets, should we be more concerned about how far droplets travel or how many droplets there are or the size of the droplets as they're coming out? Uh, or is it just a combination of both those things? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think in uh, regard to COVID-19, this is an evolving science. So just week by week, you can see the data uh, being uh, more precise. And, and I, I think it's, I think we've kind of unest underestimated the, how far the particles can go and, and which type are, are, are worse. Uh, the aerosol ones, it seems to me that it's coming into focus that the aerosolized ones that are uh, lighter and can stay in the air, especially in closed spaces, are possibly worrisome. I think it is all of the above, but um, we're learning as time goes on. I, I remember, you know, six, uh, four, six months ago, people said, well, it's okay, it doesn't spread. And, you know, that's clearly changed. <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't know the exact answer, but as we learn more and more about it, the more I think we've under underestimated how contagious this is. Thank you. And following on from that, uh, another question that we've had here in the chat is that, uh, as you mentioned, the science is evolving and the, uh, the public health messaging on masks has changed slightly from early on to now. But to give you a chance to re-emphasize, currently, what is the public health guidance on uh, now, whether people should be wearing masks uh, and their effectiveness? Yeah, I think the general consensus worldwide is that masks work and everyone should wear a mask of course, we're trying to shed light on which ones are truly covering and providing barriers. But if you're in a public space, so you're around other people, you don't know if they have infection or not. And, and uh, even if you're socially distancing, I think it's a good idea 
to wear a mask because again, six feet is just a, a rule of thumb. The, the longer or farther apart you are from someone, the better. <laughs> and um, wearing a, a mask is not 100% protection. I mean, even if you wear an, an N95 and you're taking care of someone in a hospital, a small percentage of those folks actually can get infected even with an N95 and a, a face shield and, and gowns and gloves. So we're all talking about re reducing the percentages and general guidance, even, uh, uh, you know, it's a consensus that you ought to be wearing a mask um, when you're around other people. And the one reason maybe most people don't know it, it, it seemed obvious to me, is that you're also protecting yourself uh, when you're wearing it, but you're protecting other people from you if you don't know that you have the infection. So the asymptomatic spread, the I can be contagious and not feel sick, often people don't understand that. And that's a big deal. You don't want to infect. And what I learned from this study, being in that study myself, is that just speaking can potentially spread this to other people. It, I don't have to yell, I don't have to sneeze or cough. So being around other family members, uh, you know, at a picnic or around a table uh, without a mask can be spreading a disease. Sure, and, and I, to follow up on that, uh, it seems that you know the that's one of the key findings here is everybody's been worried about coughing and sneezing in particular. Uh, were you surprised at the extent to which um, speaking uh, dispersed droplets? And do you think that there's actual public health guidance that should change or tweak um, as a result of that when we talk about gatherings and and the numbers of people that are safe to gather and the distances and so forth? Well, it was surprising to me. You know, we saw this method used in just one person, and we extended that. You know, the laser idea, and you know, I didn't believe that that my speech would give particles. I don't see them. You know, right? So that's the idea of the laser. It actually makes the smaller particles sparkle, so you can see them. And then, with a camera and a computer, you count them. Uh, it was surprising to me, and I think a lot of people might not believe it unless they see it. So that's one important reason why we have video of the experiment itself for people to see and, and be the judge. We're not talking about small, statistically significant differences. We're talking about huge, clinically significant, obvious differences that you can see with your own eyes. You know, I, I think the guidance uh, is good that to wear a mask, you know, just by, um, by default, you know, instead of the other way around is, do I need to wear one here? Do I need to wear one there? So that, but then I was trained as a physician, got used to the idea of when you go into an operating room, you know, you just, you gown up and you wear a mask. And so it's not a big deal for me. It was kind of obvious. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, the video from the study. We've had some questions about the process of the paper. Um, one of those, uh, Professor Fisher, was asking about um, uh, the order in which the masks were tested. Uh, do you, is there a chance that there were any temporal trends that might have confounded your results? And I realize your end goal was not to uh, rigorously test the difference between masks, but just to demonstrate the technique. But do you think that the results you found between different masks could be in some way confounded by the order that you tested them? Um, I don't believe so. So the, the box in which we spoke into was basically cleared out by, by dust-free air between measurements. So we had this box, which was actually open at the top and it was connected to a tube which fed HEPA filtered air into the box to make sure between experiments, we clear that box out of any residual droplets that might float around. Also before the experiment, part of the video is 10 seconds of quiet before we start speaking, just as a baseline to make sure that there's no, no leftover things from the previous experiments. So the, the mask itself, of course, we, we took the mask. We did, not, we did not wear the mask for hours beforehand. They were all fresh masks, so they were not saturated, which of course adds another complexity to it, but we avoided that by having the mask basically fresh. There was no, no prior saturation or so going on. 
Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the questions continuing to come in. Some of them are repeat questions, and I'll remind you that we'll be sending out the uh, the recording of this briefing afterwards to everyone who registered. So uh, some questions you might not think be answered, they were answered earlier, and you'll be able to review those. One thing I will uh, restate, because we're getting lots of questions about it, is uh, about the nature of the fleece. And Professor Fisher, I think I'm correct when you said it was 92% uh, polyester and 8% spandex. Is that right? The gator that you tested? Correct. And of course, the, the term fleece was a little bit of a misnomer. There's still plenty of terms floating around. So we called it fleece in our original version of the paper, which we've now actually changed because of all the feedback we've gotten. So when we, when we say fleece, or when we did say fleece, we didn't mean the material fleece. We just meant a neck fleece as in neck gaiter. So it was not the material fleece that you would see in a fleece jacket. Um, again, it was a stretchy, polyester spandex mix. Sure, absolutely. Uh, once again, the vagaries of the English language uh, come back to bite people. And goodness me, that's been happening for thousands of years. Um, I want to come back to this issue of droplets. We've had another interesting question that um, uh, Dr. Westman, maybe you can tackle first. Well, you mentioned about how you found that the, uh, the gator created smaller droplets. Um, and the question we had is, are the smaller droplets produced by the gator style mask more or less likely to carry longer distances? being smaller? And, and are those droplets more or less likely to transmit uh, and infect others with COVID-19? Or do we even know that yet? Right. Well, the, the first question is how droplets spread and how they maintain in the air it has a lot to do with the air that, that is around you. You know, if you, you're in a subway or an airplane and the air is filtered through the top or the bottom, or you're in a, a closed room and there's no movement of air, it, the dynamics are very, uh, very different. And if you're outdoors, it's thought to be better because it's being carried away. Uh, the, um, uh, and I guess the second question is not, it's not really worked out. I mean, remember our study didn't test the transmission of the virus, right? We just looked at particles, which we infer, and I mean, there's good inference, but that these may spread the virus. Uh, and, um, and the blocking, we, so we're assuming that the blocking of these particles is a good thing and will reduce the spread now. But the, the reason that's a, a, a logical thing to, to think about and to assume is that if you put hamsters in cages and you connect them uh, and uh, put a barrier that are different fabrics, different mass type materials, you actually reduce the transmission of COVID-19 from hamster to hamster in a study that was done in Hong Kong. So there's, and, and they weren't, you know, coughing and sneezing on the, the, each other. So there, we're, we're triangulating in using a lot of different information. And, but the, these are assumptions that, that, that the reduction of particles being admitted would have a positive benefit. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. We are very close to time here. Uh, we made this a 30 minutes event. And before we go, um, one question I'm, um, I'm going to pose to you both um, that came in through the chat, which was, what should people be looking for in a face covering? Uh, and I realize these are kind of situation dependent. But uh, I think one thing I'm hoping that we can leave people with is, is maybe some guidance on uh, some recommendations as to what kind of face covering they might need. Uh, Dr. Westman, anything you can offer on that? Sure. From my perspective, when I'm in the clinic, I'm seeing patients, I'm not socially distancing. I'm wearing a surgical grade mask. It's handed out at work. I, I get a new one every day. Uh, if I'm out and about grocery shopping, I wear one that's uh, a cotton double layer. It's easy to put on, easy to take off, it's comfortable. Uh, if I'm in my car, I'm not wearing it. Uh, you know, driving myself with the windows up. So it depends where I am. I, I'm not in the hospital taking care of people with known disease. They're wearing the full PPE. Certainly, that makes sense. And uh, Professor Fisher, as we wrap up, A, if you've got any more thoughts on that, and B, I'd love to give you the opportunity to re-emphasize once again what you think the main takeaway should be from your research. So the main takeaway really was that we developed a simple technique to visualize these droplets in the hope that other people will pick up on this, we did not study all masks. We did not really recommend or, or discourage people from a particular type of mask. We didn't have statistics to do this. We hope that this will catch on and people will start testing their own masks or manufacturers can test masks. 
um, community setting can do use it as a demonstration to see the droplets that are coming out of your mouth and the, the easy way of a mask to actually block some of them. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and we'll call it there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panel, panelists, Eric Westman and Martin Fisher. Our next briefing will be next Wednesday, August 19th, when we'll be discussing hurricane season and how a severe storm could affect the spread of COVID, as well as how the pandemic could hamper disaster response. If you'd like to be included on the advisory for that or future briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu. In the meantime, thank you to our panelists. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please stay well. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.